Welcome everyone to lecture number 21 on the post-colonial era in African and Middle Eastern history. Now we've talked quite a bit about imperialism in this class, how colonial governments, especially during the 19th century, would come into various areas of the world to impose their own systems of law, to impose their religion, to uh, basically uh, economically take advantage of many different subject populations around the world. Specifically in Africa, the legacy of all of this meddling on the part of many European powers is going to be terrible. If you'll recall during the so-called scramble for Africa and the Berlin Conference, you've got European countries coming into this continent and basically carving it up just without any sort of, of um, accounting for ethnic differences or religious differences. They're just kind of clumping people together and many of these people do not get along. For example, ethnic tensions were a, di a direct result of post-colonialism in East Central Africa. In the nation of Rwanda, as it achieves its independence over time, uh, ethnic rivalries between its majority population of Hutu and its minority population of the Tutsi will resolve, uh, will, excuse me, result in mass executions in 1994. Members of the Hutu ethnic, ethnic group began slaughtering as many as 800,000 people, mostly of the Tutsi minority. This genocide spread throughout the country with staggering speed and brutality. By July of that year, hundreds of thousands of Rwandans were dead and many more displaced from their homes. So this is just one example of, you know, the aftermath of these colonial powers as they finally agree to exit many of these African nations, they're leaving them in sham shambles. Something similarly tragic will happen to the population of the Sudan after it achieves its independence in 1956 from Britain. Religion, language, and race all became pivotal factors in this ongoing conflict. Believe it or not, there is still civil war marking this region. And then there's also the influence of the Cold War. Both the United States and the Soviet Union sought to vary it, sought to influence the various military-led governments in this region from the 1960s to the 1970s. So in other words, both sides are using the Sudanese people as proxies to fight a war against the other major power. Then in 1978, oil was discovered in the South, and this just adds another wrinkle to this tragic situation. To help deal with some of these many issues after colonial powers left the continent, the OAU will be created in 1963, the Organization of African Unity. The original OAU charter signed in Addis Ababa in May of 1963 uh, included 32 governments that agreed to work together to address issues such as refugee populations, human rights, and helping these newly independent countries build infrastructure and maintain their independence. Since then, a further 21 states have joined gradually over the years, and ultimately it will be renamed the African Union, which is still in existence today. Now, if you'll recall from a prior lecture, South Africa had been colonized originally by the Dutch and then later taken over by the British. A terrible byproduct of this long period of colonial domination at the hands of outsiders led to the creation of a policy known as apartheid in South Africa. This was a formalized state policy that developed in South Africa that deliberately segregated the races into separate neighborhoods and ultimately what it will do is prevent the black majority in South Africa from rising to positions of influence within their own government. It will prevent the black majority from achieving economic success as many of them will be forcibly kept out, uh, not only of certain areas of the country, but um, uh, picked over, chosen, not chosen for uh, positions of economic influence. Nelson Mandela will be a South African activist that want, wants to work over time on trying to achieve more equality between the races in South Africa. He will join uh, several groups uh, such as the African National Congress. He will initially try to build support for nonviolent means of protest against these discriminatory apartheid era laws. Ultimately, though, his participation in uh, one particular incident that did involve some violence uh, meant that he was sentenced to life imprisonment in a South African jail. 
Throughout his incarceration, Mandela, Mandela retained wide support among South Africa's black population, and his imprisonment actually became an international celebrity cause, uh, and it was a symbol of this terrible system of apartheid. By 1990, the South African government finally yielded to international pressure and released Mandela from prison. Mandela will then go on to lead the African National Congress in negotiations to end apartheid and to bring a peaceful transition to non-racial democracy in South Africa. In April of 1994, he won South Africa's first elections that were held by universal suffrage and sworn in as president of the country's first multi-ethnic government. He will also go on to receive the Nobel Peace Prize for his tireless efforts on, on behalf of his countrymen and women. Now I want to return back to the sick man of Europe, the Ottoman Empire, which will ultimately collapse after World War I. As a result of the loss of control of major regions that had once been under Ottoman domination, essentially the remains, the husk of the Ottoman Empire will remain in what we think of as the present day country of Turkey. And the individual responsible for the creation of an independent Turkey will be Mustafa Kemal Ataturk. He will end up leading a movement for independence in the region. He will also be intensely interested in trying to modernize this new country of Turkey. Through military action, he will help to throw off France, Britain, and Greece as they all sought to try to get a piece of Turkey after the end of World War I. Uh, he will uh, manage to establish an independent state in 1921. And Turkey became a secular republic with Ataturk as its pres president in 1923. He will establish a single party regime that will last almost without interruption until 1945. As leader of a newly independent Turkey, he will launch an ambitious program of revolutionary social and political reform to modernize his country. These reforms included the emancipation of women. They were now granted the right to vote. Uh, they outlawed polygamy, a man having more than one, one wife. Women are now granted the right to divorce. New Western legal codes, secular law codes, will be introduced. Western style types of dress, a Western calendar, and even an alphabet will be introduced to replace the Arabic script with a Latin one. So he is truly reshaping Turkey during this period. Now there were certainly a number of instances of European powers that were deeply reluctant to let go of their colonial holdings over time. Egypt had been occupied by Great Britain since 1882, and m despite much resentment and agitation for freedom after World War I, in 1922 Britain declared their independence but still occupied the country of Egypt militarily and controlled its politics. Essentially what will be created is the, the mandate system in many areas of Africa as well as the Middle East. And this system is one where the country technically has its independence, but really from behind the scenes, a European power is still calling all of the shots. The discovery of oil, for instance, by Western powers near the turn of the 20th century led Britain and France to redouble their efforts to maintain control in Iran or Persia, as it was known during this period. A strong independence movement, though, emerged in Persia after World War I, and we will see that by the 1920s, Reza Shah Pahlavi will be uh, put in charge of a newly independent Persia, which will be renamed Iran. Under his rule, the government and society was transformed in a number of different ways. It was modernized to include large-scale industries, major infrastructure projects such as railroads, bridges were built, uh, a national public education system, improved health care, um, but many, there were also many stresses on this new country. The Shah was not well liked by the local population. Many people bristled, for example, at ongoing British meddling in newly independent Iran. For instance, the Anglo-Persian Oil Company was established in 1908 following the discovery of a large oil field. Uh, eventually, this company will go through several name changes to where it becomes BP, or British Petroleum Company. For half a century, profit from this country flowed into European hands, not local Iranian hands, as the British government owned a majority share. 
The United States also became keenly interested in this region for its access to oil as well as a strategic place for U.S. troops battling their Cold War nemesis, the Soviet Union. And in fact, by 1953, we will see basically the United States, with the support of the CIA, reinstalling uh, the Shah in Iran. The people had protested and evicted him, but the United States, uh, with this Cold War mentality, decided to put him back into power. This was a bad decision. While the country continued to modernize in certain ways, they became, uh, the citizens became more and more desperate. Their leadership became increasingly hostile to the people. He seemed insensitive and out of touch to the laboring poor and the masses. And what we'll see is an element of religious fundamentalism will become involved in what becomes known as the Iranian Revolution of 1979. As the Shah's regime, supported by the U.S., became increasingly repressive, riots developed into a state of virtual civil war. And in early 1979, uh, popular opposition forced the Shah to leave the country. Anti-U.S. sentiment boiled over because the Shah went to the United States and the United States took him in. Uh, the U.S. Embassy in uh, Tehran was taken over by members of the Iranian Revolution and American hostages were taken. In the end, we will see the establishment of an Islamic Republic in Iran and the leadership of a Shia majority. In other words, this will be a conservative religious government set up in Iran after um, ejecting U.S. and foreign influences. Another classic example of a Middle Eastern ruler who worked with foreign powers to maintain his authority was Ibn Saud, the first king of a unified Saudi Arabia. During World War I, Saudi Arabia allied with the British in exchange for, um, you know, British access to oil and money to be made from that. Their relationship with the United States will deepen after World War II. Again, as the United States sought territory or friendly territory as a counterweight to the Soviet Union, and the U.S. also sought access to oil fields in Saudi Arabia. So not all leaders in this region are going to automatically say no to the British or say no to the French or no to the Americans because some of them end up becoming quite wealthy off the exchange of guns, uh, off the exchange of oil field concessions and the like. These were deals that some of these power brokers in the region were willing to make with outside powers. In the case of the creation of the new country of Israel after World War II, this is a state that could not have been created without European insistence and military support. We talked about the Zionist movement of the late 19th and early 20th century, Jews around the globe seeking a safe homeland to settle in. After the collapse of the Ottoman Empire during World War I, Britain took over the region of Palestine and issued the Balfour Declaration, in announcing its intent to establish a Jewish homeland there. But I'll return to a point I made in a prior lecture. This is not empty land. There are Arab Palestinians that are in this region, and they are being displaced from their homes, farms, and businesses. So in 1948, the nation of Israel was created, and uh, ultimately the regions will be partitioned between Jewish settlements and Arab settlements. This is going to trigger a number of attacks on the part of Palestinians who feel like, again, uh, they're, they're, they're losing their country to these outsiders. Israel's borders will increase, though, over time, as many Western powers, including the United States and Britain, sell armaments and guns to the Israeli government. Uh, we will see that the clashes between Palestinians and those who support the Palestinian Arabs will become deadlier over time. The Six-Day War, for instance, uh, it was a brief war that took place in June of 1967. Israel decisively defeated uh, many other powers that had allied against them. We will see Israel staging a preemptive air assault on a number of their neighbors that they felt like were conspiring against them, destroying more than 90 percent of Egypt's air force, for example, on the tarmac before they even took to the skies. The Arab country's losses in the conflict were disastrous, uh, and we will see they will also lose a number of their population in this war with Israel. It will take many more years to get representatives from Egypt and Israel to the bargaining table where they could settle things peacefully rather than through war. The Camp David Accords, brokered by U.S. President Jimmy Carter in 1978, were a huge step forward in Egypt finally recognizing the country of Israel. 
The leaders of both countries were awarded the Nobel Peace Prize in 1978 for their contributions to the agreements. Unfortunately, this will still not settle down tensions between Israel and many of its Arab neighbor, neighbors over time.